In experiment 21, we're going to be carrying out an acid-base titration. So what exactly is a titration? Well, it's simply a method for measuring the amount of a substance in a particular solution. Titration is a very common tool that chemists use for analyzing substances. Probably the most common is an acid-base titration, where we try to determine, say, the amount of hydrogen ion in a particular solution. Earlier in the semester, we did a titration to measure the amount of calcium in a sample of hard water. You can even measure such things as the amount of nitrogen in a soil sample. If you're a farmer and you need to know how fertile your soil is, knowing the amount of nitrogen can be extremely helpful. There's a few terms that you should know. A titrant is the known substance. When we carry out a titration, we have to have one substance that has a known concentration. We will add that to a substance that has an unknown concentration, and that is known as the analyte. That's the thing we're trying to analyze. So we have one substance whose concentration is known. We have another substance whose concentration is unknown. And essentially what we do is we'll add titrant to the analyte until the reaction is just complete. And then by determining the amount or the number of moles of the titrant, we can figure out the number of moles of the substance in the unknown solution, the analyte, and we can then determine its concentration. Now, in order to do that, we need the balanced chemical equation. We can't just assume that for every mole of titrant, you will react with one mole of analyte. That's often the case. But what would happen if it was a 2 to 1 ratio? What if it took 2 moles of titrant for every 1 mole of analyte? In that case, once you determine the number of moles of the titrant, the moles of analyte would actually be half of that. So we have to have a balanced chemical equation so we know the stoichiometry of the reaction. We also need an indicator. You may recall back in the water hardness lab, we used something called areochrome black T. That was an indicator that was sensitive to calcium. In this particular case, we're going to use phenylphthalein. That is probably the most common acid-base indicator. It is colorless when the solution is acidic, and it turns pink when the solution is basic. So we know when the reaction is done, when that color change occurs, and that point in a titration is logically called the end point. That is the, the moment where you've added just the right number of moles of the titrant to neutralize all of the moles of the analyte. Let's consider a titration between sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. We have here the balanced equation, so we can see that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So we'll be using a known solution of sodium hydroxide and titrating an unknown solution of hydrochloric acid. What we're looking for is the point where the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is equal to the number of moles of hydrochloric acid. That will occur at the end point of the titration, and then by figuring out the moles of our known material, we can determine the number of moles of our unknown. To calculate the moles of the sodium hydroxide, we simply take the volume that we use, so we're going in the titration, we'll be measuring how many milliliters it requires to neutralize the hydrochloric acid sample, and we'll simply put that volume in, but we'll convert it into liters since molarity is in liters. And then we'll multiply that volume times the concentration of the sodium hydroxide in molarity, and that is something we will know. In today's lab, we're actually going to standardize our sodium hydroxide so we know very accurately what its molarity is. We'll do the same thing then to get the moles of HCl. You can multiply the volume of HCl, whatever the sample happens, volume happens to be, times its concentration, and that would give us the moles of HCl.
So we can write that as a pretty simple equation. The volume times the concentration of the sodium hydroxide has to equal the volume times the concentration of the HCl. In the titration, we already know the concentration of sodium hydroxide. That is our, our uh, titrant. We will measure the volume that's required to complete the titration, and we will measure the sample volume of the HCl that we start with, which means the only thing that's going to be unknown is the concentration of our analyte. And by knowing these other three factors, we can easily calculate the concentration of the HCl. To measure the volumes accurately in a titration, we use a device called a burette. So the burette, it's sort of like a graduated cylinder, only upside down. We actually start with zero milliliters at the top, and it goes to 25 milliliters at the bottom. We can re release liquid from the burette by using the stopcock. When it's in this vertical position, there's a hole in that uh, stopcock that allows the liquid to run through. If we rotate it horizontally, it stops the flow. So we can carefully add the titrant slowly to our unknown sample and then easily measure the volume. If we started at, at zero milliliters and we ended up, say, at 7.5, we know we've used 7.5 milliliters. You don't have to start at zero as long as you record your initial volume and your final volume and simply subtract those two. The burette is pretty accurate because it's marked off in increments of one-tenth of a milliliter. So if you're careful, you can estimate it to the nearest one one-hundredth of a milliliter. This is the basic setup that we use for our titration. We have a burette clamp that holds our burette in place. We fill the burette with our titrant, which in this case will be the sodium hydroxide. And then our analyte, in this case the hydrochloric acid, will be in an Erlenmeyer flask along with some of our phenolphthalein indicator, thus the pink color. We'll take an initial reading on our burette, and then we will slowly add the sodium hydroxide until the pink color just remains, and we'll then shut the stopcock, and we'll take a final reading, and the difference between the two will give us the volume of the sodium hydroxide that we use. We can then use that equation that we looked at a moment ago, where it was the volume of sodium hydroxide times its molarity equaled the volume of hydrochloric acid times its molarity. We'll know the volume of sodium hydroxide because we measured it in the burette. We will know the volume of the hydrochloric acid because we will also have measured that initially. And we know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide because that is something that we determine in the beginning of the experiment. So the only unknown value is the concentration of the hydrochloric acid, which we can then calculate. Let's go through a sample titration of the sodium hydroxide and the KHP. The first thing we have to do is to standardize our solution of sodium hydroxide. We're going to prepare a solution that's approximately 0.3 moles per liter, but we won't know it exactly. So we have to first do a titration to determine more accurately that concentration. So we're going to take a sample of KHP, potassium hydrogen phthalate. This is its chemical formula. We'll dissolve that sample into some deionized water, add some phenolphthalein, so we'll know when the endpoint is, and then we will carry out a titration. We will add sodium hydroxide solution until the pink color just persists, and then we will measure that volume. So in this particular case, we found that it took 13.73 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide solution to neutralize the sample of KHP. Now this is also a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, so the number of moles of KHP is going to be the same 
as the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. To get the moles of KHP is very simple. We know how many grams we measured, so we simply use the molar mass that we can determine from the formula, and then we can calculate the number of moles of KHP. And we know, of course, because it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, that the moles of KHP also equals the moles of sodium hydroxide. So now we know two things about the sodium hydroxide. We know how many moles are in our sample, and we know how many milliliters there were. From that, we can calculate the molarity. All we have to do is change the milliliters into liters, and now we have the molarity of our sodium hydroxide solution. In the lab, we'll do this process twice to make sure that we get the same value. So this is now our standardized sodium hydroxide solution. Next, we'll be titrating a sample of vinegar. Vinegar contains acetic acid, and that also reacts in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's one mole of sodium hydroxide to one mole of acetic acid. So we're going to measure out a five milliliter sample of vinegar, and to do that we'll use a second burette. That way we can get a very accurate volume to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter. Again, we'll put it in an Erlenmeyer flask. We'll add some additional deionized water just so we have a large enough volume that we can see. Adding additional deionized water will not affect our titration because all of the acid is in the vinegar. There are no hydrogen ions, essentially, in deionized water. Once again, we'll carry out the titration. This time, it took 14.85 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide solution to reach the endpoint. And from that, we can calculate the molarity of the acetic acid. We know we used 14.85 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. We have to change milliliters into liters, of course, because that's what molarity is in. If we multiply that volume times the molarity of our standardized solution, we now know how many moles of sodium hydroxide were required to reach the endpoint. Because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, of course, the number of moles of acetic acid is going to be the same. So we know the number of moles of acetic acid in the sample. We know its volume in milliliters, but of course to get molarity we'll need to change that into liters. And now there's the molarity of our sample. So we've been able to determine the molarity of acetic acid in that unknown solution. Well, now it's time to head off to the lab. So we're going to go into the lab and do this same process. We'll, we'll standardize our sodium hydroxide with two runs. We'll then carry out two titrations of samples of vinegar. And then you can use that data to complete the lab and answer the questions. Earlier in the semester, we carried out a titration between a sample of hard water and EDTA. Today we're going to be doing another titration experiment, and this is a more common one called an acid-base titration. So we're going to be taking a sample of an acid which has an unknown concentration, that's going to be vinegar. Vinegar contains approximately 5% acetic acid, but we're going to try to determine more precisely that value. We're going to titrate it by adding to it sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a base, acetic acid is an acid, so the two will neutralize each other. And like we did in our previous titration, our sodium hydroxide solution will have a known concentration, and we're going to add that to a sample of vinegar using our burette so that we can measure precisely how much of the sodium hydroxide is required to neutralize the vinegar. The first thing we're going to need to do is to dilute this concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide. This is much too concentrated. It would only take a very tiny amount. So we're going to dilute this from 6 molar down to about 0.3 molar by diluting it in water. 
Now, that won't be a very exact process, so we're not going to know precisely that it's 0.3 molar solution. So once we've made this approximate 0.3 molar solution of sodium hydroxide, we're going to standardize it to make sure we know precisely what its concentration is. To do that, we are going to use another acid called KHP, potassium hydrogen phthalate. The advantage of using a solid acid is we can weigh it out very accurately because it's in its pure form. So we're going to weigh a sample of this, dissolve it in water, and then we will add our diluted approximately 0.3 molar sodium hydroxide to it and determine precisely how much sodium hydroxide is required. Knowing the number of moles of KHP from its mass, we can figure out how many moles of sodium hydroxide there were and now know more accurately what the, the concentration of our diluted sodium hydroxide solution is. We can then use that now standardized sodium hydroxide and titrate a sample of our vinegar solution. The first thing we need to do is to dilute our sodium hydroxide solution. So we have our six molar sodium hydroxide and we're going to dilute it in a clean plastic bottle to make our approximately 0.3 molar solution. So the first thing we'll need to do is measure out about 25 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide. It doesn't have to be exact because we're going to standardize the solution in a few minutes anyway. So that's just slightly more than 25 milliliters, but that will be fine. We'll go ahead and put that into our clean, empty bottle. And then to make sure that we got all of the sodium hydroxide transferred, we'll go ahead and rinse out the graduated cylinder. We'll add another 25 milliliters or so of water to that. Again, the amount is not critical. And then to get the appropriate concentration, to get down to that about 0.3 molar solution, we'll add about 500 milliliters of deionized water, and that amount of dilution should get us down to just about where we want to be. So we'll take this diluted solution, make sure we mix it up very thoroughly, and then we can use this to standardize. So we will measure out a sample of KHP and then we will uh, do a titration with a couple of samples of the unknown sodium hydroxide solution to determine what its concentration actually is. Here's the mass of our first sample of KHP. Now that we've uh, weighed out our sample of KHP to titrate, let's go ahead and dissolve that in water. And we'll use about 25 milliliters. Again, the amount of water here is not critical. All we need to make sure is our entire sample of 0.93 grams that we weighed out in just a moment ago is all in the flask. So we'll go ahead and add the water to that and swirl it around to get it to dissolve. And while that finishes dissolving, we can go ahead and prepare our first burette. This burette is the one that will contain our sodium hydroxide. So we're going to rinse it like we did in that previous titration lab. We'll use some deionized water to rinse out our burette a little bit. Let that drain through. We want to make sure if there's any contamination in here, we get rid of it. We'll do a couple of rinsings with the water. I'll swirl this around a bit to make sure we rinse the sides down. And now there should be nothing in our burette but deionized water. Now we're ready to prepare our sample of sodium hydroxide. So this is our soon to be standardized sodium hydroxide. I've already taken the liberty of writing standardized on the bottle. So we'll go ahead and put a little bit of this in here to start so we can rinse it out. 
There we go. We'll swirl this around a little bit, make sure we get all the deionized water out of here. Go ahead and let it drain through. And then we'll drain the rest of it while we swirl it out the other side. Let's go ahead and do that again. It's always a good idea to put any two rinsings here to make sure there's nothing in the burette except the sodium hydroxide. So again, let's swirl this around a little bit to rinse it. Let that drain out. And now we're ready to fill it. So now there should be nothing in the burette except our diluted and soon to be standardized sodium hydroxide. So we'll go ahead and drain this a little bit. I put it a bit above the zero mark, so we'll let some of this drain out and then we'll be ready to go. We'll go ahead and try to run that down as close to the zero mark as we can. It doesn't have to be on the zero exactly, of course. And that looks pretty good. Always a good idea. There's a drop of sodium hydroxide still on the tip. We'll just shoot that off, and now our burette is ready to go. Here's our initial burette reading. I've got it set just about exactly at zero, and we'll go ahead and set it at zero for each of the titrations. All right, we're just about ready to go with our titration now. The only thing we're missing is an indicator. You may remember when we did the uh, water hardness lab, we used Areochrome Black T, which was an indicator that was sensitive to calcium. Today we're going to use an indicator called phenylphthalein. You may have heard of this before. It's a common acid-base indicator. It's colorless when the solution is acidic, and it becomes pink when the solution is basic. So we're going to add two or three drops of phenylphthalein to our KHP solution here. And as expected, there's no color. Now we know that the sodium hydroxide solution is approximately 0.3 moles per liter. We weighed out 0.95 grams of KHP, and that means that it should be somewhere in the ballpark of 13 milliliters to reach the end point of the titration. If we've done this correctly, then that's about how much it should take. So we're starting at the zero mark, we can add fairly rapidly at the beginning, but as we get close, we'll slow down and go one drop at a time so that we don't overshoot our endpoint. So let's go ahead and begin to add our sodium hydroxide. We'll swirl it. I'm not using a magnet this time to mix it, so we'll just keep swirling it around. There's two, three milliliters. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we're getting closer now, there's ten, eleven, I actually started seeing little bits of pink appearing, which tells us that it's beginning to get close. So we'll go ahead and start adding this one drop at a time. until we reach the end point. There we go. So one drop at a time. We we'll swirl after each drop. And once the pink stays with us for 30 seconds, we'll know we've reached the end point. You might be able to see the little bits of pink when the drop first hits and then it disappears as it reacts with the acid. But we should be getting pretty close here. Yes, the pink is beginning to stay longer now. There we go. Let's see if that pink color stays with us for a little bit. If it does, then we've truly reached our end point. It looks like the pink is persisting, so 
we have reached the end point and it did take approximately 13 milliliters. We'll go ahead and take a more accurate reading now. Here's the burette reading from our first titration of KHP and sodium hydroxide. Keep in mind that the burette reads from top to bottom, so this is between 13 and 14 milliliters. This is the mass of KHP for our second trial. All right, let's go ahead and do our second titration. I've weighed out a second sample of KHP, which also happened to be 0.95 grams. And because we didn't have enough of the uh, sodium hydroxide left in the burette, I filled it back up right to the zero mark again, just to make it easy. So let's go ahead and add a few drops of phenylphthalein to our second solution here. And it's colorless as expected. And once again, it should be somewhere in the ballpark of 13 milliliters. So let's start out here. We're right at the zero mark. We'll go ahead and add it fairly quickly to start with and continue to swirl it. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. We're getting there. We'll take it down to about 12 again or so, and then we'll start doing it one drop at a time just to make sure we don't overshoot. You might see the little flashes of pink in there, but they're not persisting because we're not quite to the end point yet. All right. So we're about a milliliter away from where we expect it to change, so let's begin to add the phenolphthalein, or sorry, the uh, sodium hydroxide very slowly. There we go. One drop at a time, drop and swirl. You can see the pink appearing momentarily. Looks like we're getting close. All right, I think that might have done it. That last drop looks like the pink is actually staying this time. And it looks like we've used very close to the same amount, maybe just a slight bit less. So we'll make sure that this lasts for a few seconds here. If the pink doesn't go away, it means we have reached our endpoint. And it looks like we have, so let's go ahead and get a measurement of the volume here. Go ahead and record the final volume for our second trial. Now that we've completed the uh, standardization titrations for our sodium hydroxide, it's time to move on and analyze the vinegar. You will, of course, need to calculate precisely what the molarity of our standard solution is, and in the pre-lab video, I went over in detail how to do that, and you'll also find it in the lab manual instructions as well. So like we did with the uh, first burette, we're going to have to clean and fill this one, but this time with vinegar. So let's go ahead and do a couple of rinses with water, like we did before. We'll drain that out. We'll make sure there's no contamination here in our burette. And let's rinse it with water one more time just to be thorough. I'm sort of swirling the water around to make sure it rinses anything off the sides of the uh, burette. We can let some of it flow through and then we'll simply drain the rest and swirl it to rinse that out. And now we're ready to fill it with the vinegar. So we'll do a couple of rinses with the vinegar, just like we did with the deionized water. Because we've got to get all that deionized water out of the burette. So put a little bit of the vinegar in there. We'll swirl that around to try to rinse out the water. And then let that drain out to get any water out of the tip of the burette that might be in there. And let's go ahead and do that one more time. 
So again, we'll give this a bit of a swirl here to rinse out the inside and then let some of that drain out and then pour the rest out. So now our burette should have nothing in it except vinegar. Now we can go ahead and fill it. So like we did with the sodium hydroxide, we'll fill this up. We got a little bit above the zero mark, so we'll have to drain a little bit of that, and then we can get our initial reading. So we'll take our waste beaker here, and we'll try to set this right on zero like we did the other one. So we'll drain that down just a little bit, and we're right on zero. We'll shoot off that one little drop of vinegar there, and now we're about ready to go. Now, if you remember when we did the water hardness titration earlier in the semester, when we first tested our unknown and we didn't have a good idea of how much it was going to require to neutralize it, we did a, a one quick and dirty run just letting the titrant run in quickly and getting a ballpark idea so that then we could do our official two trials where we had a better idea of where the endpoint was going to take place. So I think we'll do the same thing today. So we're going to run sort of just a, a dry run here. So let's go ahead and add our approximately five milliliters. We'll see if we can hit that pretty closely here. So we need a five milliliter sample of our vinegar. There's four. Let's just sneak up on the five there. There we go five milliliters right on the nose. We'll go ahead and shoot that last drop of vinegar in there and there's our sample. Now I'm going to make a small change to the procedure in the lab book because this is very little sample. So as we did with the water hardness lab, I'm going to add some deionized water to this just to give it a little more volume so it's easier for us to see what's happening. And just as in that lab, adding deionized water will have no effect on our results because there's no hydrogen ions in deionized water it is not going to change the amount of vinegar in the flask so now we've got a sample a little easier to see here let's go ahead and add some phenylphthalein indicator so we'll put in a few drops of phenylphthalein and of course it's colorless because vinegar is acidic and now let's go ahead and begin the titration. Since we don't know where the endpoint's going to happen, I'm just going to add it fairly quickly. And as soon as it turns pink, we will stop. We'll get a reading then, and we'll figure we did overshoot a bit, but now we'll have a pretty good idea of where to slow down in the next trial. See, little bits of pink color in there, but no permanence yet. Looks like we're getting closer. All right, we're getting real close. The pink just about stayed there. We'll let it drip in here. Yes, we're getting very close. And that looks like we've got it. So that'll give us a, a pretty good idea of where the end of the titration is. We'll go ahead and record that volume, and then we'll use that as our best guess for where the end point's going to happen in the other trials. We'll stop maybe a milliliter short of that, and then sneak up on it one drop at a time. This volume will give us a ballpark idea, at least, of where the titration should end. So now we'll go ahead and do our two official trials, and we'll simply stop about a milliliter before this point, and then sneak up on it one drop at a time. 
Now that we've done our sort of rough trial, that came out to be about 12 and a half milliliters, so we now have a, a ballpark idea. So let's go ahead and prepare the first of our official samples. So we'll go ahead and add five milliliters of vinegar to our second flask. So we'll run this down to the 10 milliliter mark. There's eight, nine, and well, we'll slow it down a little bit. Just creep up on the 10. And there we go. And of course, we'll shoot that one little drop in there. There we are. Now, as we did in the previous one, let's add some deionized water just so we have a bigger volume to look at when we're watching for that endpoint. So we'll just put in an extra 25 milliliters of deionized water. And swirl that around, and then we'll add a few drops of phenolphthalein. There we go. All right. So we'll stop this time. Maybe we'll go down to about 11 and a half milliliters or so. We'll stop about a milliliter before we saw the uh, endpoint last time, and then we'll, we'll slowly creep up on that one drop at a time. So we're back at the zero mark again. I've refilled it back to 0.0, .0 milliliters. So let's start adding. There's three milliliters, four, Six. We get down to about 11, we'll slow down and sneak up on it. It's starting to see little bits of pink appearing there, but it's not staying, so we know we're not done yet. All right, we're getting close now, so let's go ahead and start adding it one drop at a time till we reach that end point. There we go, drop and swirl. We can see the pink appearing momentarily, but it's still being consumed, which means there's still acid present. Notice how I never look at the burette when I'm finishing this up, because it tends to bias you. You might want it to stop at a certain point. That looks like we might have it there. I think that did it. So let's go ahead and rinse off that last little droplet there. And it looks like our pink is staying. So we'll give that a few seconds and then we'll go ahead and take a reading. It looks like we're actually fairly close to our rough trial. We took a little bit less because last time we probably overshot it looks like we're good, so let's go ahead and take that final reading. Go ahead and record the final burette reading for our first titration of the vinegar. I went ahead and prepared the third sample, so I added another five milliliters of vinegar to our third flask, and I refilled the Murette with sodium hydroxide right back to the zero mark again to make our calculations easier. So let's add our drops of phenolphthalein here. And we'll swirl that around. Let's also go ahead and add that extra 25 milliliters of deionized water. It does make it much easier to see the color when the change occurs. There we go, that's enough sample, make it easier for us to see what's going on. So we'll go ahead and lower the burette down a little bit so it's just above the flask. And again, we should be able to go down to maybe 11 and a half milliliters or so before we uh, have to slow it down. I'm going to shift the 
stopcock around a little bit for those of us that are left-handed. So let's begin adding. And we'll add that and swirl. There's a couple of milliliters. There's four, five, six. Now I'm starting to see a little bit of pink appearing. We're at eight as it gets closer. Nine, ten. That's about eleven and a half right there. So we should be within a milliliter or so. So let's go ahead and see if we can sneak up on this. We'll start adding it again one drop at a time. There we go. Drop and swirl. You may not see the drops, but every time I swirl it, that means a drop has just fallen in. And again, I'm not going to look at the burette. I don't want to know where the volume is. I'm going to stop when the color change tells me to stop and accept that result, whatever it is. Yeah, the pink's starting to hang around a little bit longer, so we're probably getting pretty close here. Yep, I think we've got it. There we go. That looks like it may last. We'll just be sure and put that little glass drop in there. But it looks like that lovely pink color is staying, and it appears that the volume is very close to what we got in the previous two trials. So I think we're good to go. You have all the data you need now, and you have instructions in the lab manual and in the pre-lab video, so you should be able to do all of your calculations and then turn in your lab report. Go ahead and get the final burette reading for our second trial with the vinegar, and then you can take your data and go ahead and do the calculations and answer the questions at the end of the lab.